Hey guys, it's Subin Demanya, AKA ZDog MD. Guys, I'm live in my undisclosed location. <laughs> and it's undisclosed for a reason, because today I have a physician, a state senator from California, represents Sacramento, a former UC Davis academic doc, and a personal hero of mine and everybody out there who's trying to keep kids safe from preventable disease, Senator Richard Pan. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Excited. Why are we in an undisclosed location, Senator Pan? Well, I have a great fan club, and you know we just got to keep the paparazzi out. They tend to interfere with you know ca- podcasts like this. So uh, sorry, uh, we just had to do it that way. That's the thing. You don't want them like taking pictures of you in a thong on the beach, right? That's what it is. Well, it'd be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, Senator Pan, like, so what's the correct honorific for you? Is it Senator Pan, Doctor Pan? What do you prefer? Actually, I say Doctor Pan. Uh, I tell people that uh, maybe after I. Uh, I've been in the Senate as long as I've been in training. You can start calling me Senator Pan, except I'd be termed out by then. <laughs> All right. What are the term limits in Cali? Uh, so I actually am under the old term limit, so I can serve two terms in the state Senate. And uh, But I think we've gotten the work done already. I love it. So the reason I was super excited to have you on is, first yes. of all, you're a doctor. You're a senator in, in a state that is the fifth largest economy on the planet. Right. And it seems like we talk a lot on the show about like how we feel powerless as doctors, powerless as nurses, powerless. Mm-hmm. And we see in the face of like anti-vaccine advocacy online mm-hmm. with celebrities and all that. Right. Why do we feel like we don't have a voice? And then you go and somehow actually go and do stuff, actually sponsor a bill and get it through. Like, t- yeah. tell, me, tell me about this process. Or how did you get involved in this as a pediatrician? Well, I actually came to California, so I trained out in the East Coast in Boston. I was actually med school in Pittsburgh, went off to Boston, you know, did my residency and fellowship training, and I came to UC Davis actually around uh, teaching residents about social determinants of health. So uh, I was out, I, that's why I came to do is teach about community health and doctors partnering with communities to improve health and how do we partner with people. And uh, so that's what I was doing. I served on the first five commission in Sacramento County. I chaired a nonprofit to get children healthcare coverage, 65,000 children healthcare coverage who didn't previously have healthcare coverage, you know, put together a coalition to try to get more community clinics in our community. And then the Great Recession hit. Oh, wow. So, 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 but you were trained in epidemiology at like Harvard. Yes. So you actually took this, which is often an ivory tower thing, yeah. and you went and tried to make it actionable through this process. But then the Great yes. Recession hit, and what, how did that affect your... Well, so what happened is when the Great Recession hit, uh, you know, foundations lost money, so they pulled back. So we were trying to get kids healthcare coverage. Foundations were helping pay for that. Um, I saw my own patients uh, who many of, I actually focus on children with uh, learning disabilities and behavioral issues. I have a back, my clinical background is actually behavior and development. So So, so are we talking like autism? Autism, ADHD, other types of issues. So I actually trained in Boston to take care of those kids before B&D was an official subspecialty. In fact, I could have, if I wanted to, have taken the boards for that subspecialty to get board certified but I was pretty focused on my community work, so I didn't want to take another test in order to get another subspecialty. So anyway, but that's what I was doing, and uh, when the Great Recession hit, I saw what was happening in the community, what was happening to my patients, and I finally said, you know what? If I'm not willing to throw my hat in the ring, I, you know, how can I complain? So I said, I'm going to run for the state legislature. And of course, uh, most people gave me no chance of winning. Uh, I was in the wrong district because I'm a Democrat and it was a Republican district. Uh, I had uh, never held public office before, so even among Democrats, they're like, who's this guy, right? And I uh, said, nope, I'm going to you know, go out and talk to people and tell them, like, look, we need to solve problems here. Enough with the politics. We need to solve problems. Uh, people are fed up with the fact we can't put, pass the state budget at the time. You know, clinics were closing because they couldn't meet payroll because they were being paid in IOUs because there was no budget. I remember that. Remember yeah. that? Right. People were furloughed from their... Uh, their, their state jobs and actually same at UC. And I think people were like, you know, we're fed up with the politics. We want someone who wants to run because they want to solve problems. And I ran talking about things I've done. I helped 65,000 children get healthcare coverage. I was on a United Way board helping, you know, kids get, learn to read and helping our foster kids. I was, uh, you know, I was doing a lot of different, bring our community clinics together to try to figure out how do we strengthen the safety net and how do we bring in more uh, federally qualified health centers to our region. And I said, I'm not promising anything that I'm going to be doing in the legislature. I just want to tell you the things I've done and 
give me a chance to go in the legislature and see what I can do to try to make things better for people. And they they believed this. In other words, like a, a fairly conservative district said, we're mm-hmm. going to give a chance to, first of all, a person who is Asian American. Yes, <laughs> who that tra- too. <laughs> trained in an elite institution yeah. and so on and so forth as right. an academic. It's right. really not a typical, I'm from Clovis. Yeah. I mean, Central Valley is yeah. very conservative. Mm-hmm. Now, yeah. how, how did you appeal to that um that sensibility, because it is a different kind of moral palette, right, that you're trying well, to appeal to. Well, let's put it this way. Um, beyond their party registration, most people want the same thing, right? They want they want to see their lives improved, right? They want government to support them. And uh, that's why I ran on. They want to have someone who's willing to face the facts and solve problems and not just uh, go and make political hay out of stuff. And so that's why I said I didn't go around promising I'm going to— st- do X, Y, and Z as an elected official, people have heard promises all the time from politicians. They don't believe them. And uh, instead of talking about things that, quote, I'm going to do, I said, these are things I've done. This is my track record. Give me a chance to show what I can do in the legislature, given my track record, the things I've already accomplished. These are, that's my track record. Look at that and say, give me a chance to, to uh, solve problems when I get there. And as a physician, again, you're good at solving problems. You diagnose, right. you make a differential, mm-hmm. you come up with a plan, right. you maybe throw some things against the wall and see if they work. How did you get involved? You're a pediatrician. How did you get involved on the vaccine thing? Because that's how really you got on my radar right. uh, was the, the, the bills talking about vaccine exemptions. Can you describe that process? So interesting enough, I certainly did not run for the legislature to write vaccine legislation. In fact, in some ways, we thought that was sort of done, uh, but unfortunately Didn't it wasn't. Didn't we all? Didn't we all? Yes. Right. Uh, so in terms of vaccines, I would first of all mention is, is that uh, when I was in medical school, I actually was at University of Pittsburgh where Jonas Salk invented the polio vaccine. I actually was taught by Julius Younger, who worked with Jonas Salk on that vaccine. He taught microbiology. Uh, and uh, in many ways, we were told, well, these diseases like measles, you probably won't see in your practice because of vaccination. However, uh, in my fourth year of medical school, I was out uh, in Philadelphia with the U.S. Public Health Service uh, doing a co-step program, and there was a huge measles outbreak. Over mm. 900 people infected, nine children died. Mm. I actually saw a real case of measles when I was out there mm. and realized like these diseases, they have not gone away. And when people don't get vaccinated, because that's what happened, we have people who didn't get vaccinated, these diseases spread. And you end up with the chaos that we saw in Philadelphia Uh, Here in California, there was a large measles outbreak about the same time, a little earlier in Los Angeles. And uh, so as I went on uh, and off to, uh, you know, residency training and then here to California, one of the things we were tracking was the rising rate of non-medical exemptions. And in fact, right before I got elected. So so, so sorry, sorry, explain non-medical exemptions. So non-medical exemptions are basically personal belief exemptions and religious exemptions. Right. So so I'm a Jehovah's Witness. I can't have needles. Well, interesting enough, you know, in California, we really just had uh, personal belief exemptions. But frankly, uh, under the First Amendment, you can say, I just don't believe in vaccines and that's my religion and that's done. Mm. Right. You can't discriminate between, quote, religions. Right. So um, so actually, before I even got into office, we had a large pertussis outbreak here in California where we had 10 infants die, hundreds, I think over 800 hospitalized, 9000 infected. And in fact, the legislature, before I got there, had said, well, we need to do something about that. In fact, passed a law requiring the pertussis vaccine for seventh grade. Mm. So when I came into the legislature, people said, you know, they examined what happened, that outbreak, and they said, boy, it's happening in the communities where we have the highest percentage of people having personal belief exemptions. We need to do something about that. This has been trending upward for over a decade, Mm. and something needs to be done. And so they came and approached me, I guess the pediatrician, right, who's in the legislature and said, um, well, there's this law in the state of Washington that we'd like to try out here in California. That was AB 2109. And that law was the one that said, if you want an exemption, you need to talk to a licensed healthcare professional and about the vaccine and the disease they prevent. Because California at that time was basically one of the most lax states in the entire country. All you have to say is, I don't want to get my kid vaccinated to the school, and they're in, mm. right? And said, okay, we need to do something. We had a big pertussis outbreak. We need to do something about that. And in fact, I authored AB 2109 and uh, got to meet Rob Schneider. 
Oh my gosh, he's a, a notorious. <laughs> Rob Schneider is an anti-vaxxer, right? <laughs> right? So you got to meet him because what he was protesting, what you were trying to do. Yeah, I actually have to admit that that same year, uh, a colleague of mine was doing a paparazzi bill. Got uh, uh, was it uh, 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 Harry Bally? I got Rob Schneider. So I said, like, "I'm doing the wrong bills here." <laughs> you, you remember the, the you remember the prices, right? When you would lose, it would be like right. bom, 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 bom. <laughs> that's what I, when you saw that. So 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 Rob Schneider. So you author this bill. So th- then what happened? Yeah. So. This is, it's, yeah, I'm like on the edge of my seat. Actually, Rob Schneider goes and he brings his experts with him who, huh. t- who tells me who tells me that he's done the research oh, on God. vaccines and vaccines cause autism. Right. Mm-hmm. So first of all, vaccines, of course, didn't uh, stop disease uh, it was nutrition. Vaccines cause autism. And he came in and told me that I forgot exactly which year. I think it was 2050 that 120 percent of all boys will get autism because of vaccination. 120 percent. 120 percent. That's that's I think that's a little low, Richard. Don't you think? Like, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I think with some hard work and dedication in the Senate, we can get that up to 150 <laughs> percent. This is insane. Right. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like looking at it, I'm going, OK. All right, 120%. <laughs> so, and you're a behavioral health special. I mean, you deal yes, with this. Right. Is what you must see. But the death of expertise says that Rob Schneider, who is a, I, now I can say this, you can't. He's a ding dong celebrity that knows nothing, knows more than a Harvard trained epidemiologist and pediatrician about these same processes, yeah. 120% autism rate. Right. But he is given probably more credibility by the public than you would be had you no platform and you went out and said this. And that's where yeah. we are. And, right. and so now you're yes. in this morass. Yes. You've been sucked in as the pediatrician. You care about this clearly. Right. You've worked with measles in an outbreak. Yes. Uh, you're an expert in things like autism as well. Mm-hmm. And what happened next? Well, we were successful in getting that bill uh, signed into law. And uh, but one thing I did learn from doing that bill, we also had Bob Sears come and you know testify against the bill and so forth. Bob but, Sears is an anti-vaccine physician in California who's been reprimanded by the state licensing board for giving vaccine exemptions without proper exam or documentation. Not just reprimanded; he's on probation. So yes. double secret probation or just probation? No, he's yeah. well, he's on probation. Yeah, yeah. so he's uh, uh, so. One of the things, though, I did learn in doing uh, that bill was is that uh, how important it was to actually engage pro-science parents. So explain that to me, because yes. this is a group of people that is often ignored, parents who actually care about science, they actually yes. are passionate about community immunity and right. keeping children safe. How did you involve, how did you do that? So, so, what we, so what happened with 2109 is you'd have doctors and public health experts go and say, okay, you know, this is why vaccines are important. You'd have uh, a mom who says, my child's vaccine injured. Mm. And then it, this is, just doesn't look good when you have a doctor says, well, actually, that's not true mm. or that's wrong. Uh, that was, there's no evidence behind that. And, Ooh, and but you he, look like a bad person, right? Because here they are. Right. They, you can't prove that it didn't cause yeah. this injury right well even if you can to tell a mom that they're wrong about their child just, right i mean yeah. after all don't forget jenny mccarty right this is what, what her proof was her child right, right. It wasn't a study wasn't anything like that that was to mommy I mean, that was, right it's it's the right exactly and so that doesn't play very well right it doesn't play well on oprah winfrey it doesn't play well in the state legislature in the hearing room right you know who it doesn't play with that yeah. really matters rob schneider there you go you know what if it played better with him maybe you know, maybe. You know. No, so, so here you are now. Right. You, you realize the emotion of this, the difficult yes. situation you're in. Mm-hmm. You're a doctor. You're also right. a politician. Your hands are often tied by what you can say and how you say it. So what did you do next? Well, so well, we passed the bill. We're very excited about it. And then the bill didn't actually get implemented until uh, the 2014-15 school year. Uh-huh. And so in January of 2015, two things showed up in the news. So first of all, of course, the results of the 20, you know, from the Department of Public Health, the personal belief exemption has actually dropped for the first time in over a decade, Ooh. thanks to AB 2109. Really exciting, right? We dropped about 20%. Um, uh, but we also knew, because remember I modeled it after state of Washington law? Where they had counseling and all that. Yeah, so yeah. it was the same thing. So they had also dropped 20% their first year, but after that, it started to rise again. Personal belief exemptions. Personal belief exemptions, right. Because what happened is you got the people probably got out of convenience, not, and then what happened is, is that it trended back up. So we knew it was a one-year phenomenon. Right. But the other thing that ha- was happening in the news at the same time in January 2015 is there was a measles outbreak that was traced back to Disneyland in December of 2014. And that started to spread. 
And we started hearing from parents. Parents started calling my office as well as other people saying that we need to do something about this, right? Mm. I have a child, I have a baby, it's too young to be vaccinated. And uh, what do I do? Do I stay, do I just hole up at home? I have a child who's being treated for cancer and I'm afraid to send them to school because we have this measles outbreak, right? Because the measles was showing up, it was showing up on BART here, mm -hmm. it was showing up in restaurants, you know, you go to Costco, you go to a clinic. Wait, 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 that's where we draw the line. <laughs> if it shows up at Costco, that's a, a declare apocalypse because I can't live without that. There yeah. you go. Yeah, so you, it's showing up all over the place. Right, so parents are calling saying, you know, this is ridiculous, what can we do about this, right? Yeah. And having learned the lessons from AB 2009, we said, okay, um, we want to connect you up with each other. Mm. And so we connected them up with each other and they formed Vaccinate California. And that's our pro-science parent group uh, that then went out and actually then sponsored our bill, uh, the one I did with Senator Ben Allen, SB 277, to simply abolish the non-medical exemptions. We said, okay, enough is enough. People have had it. You know, people are, we, we're going through this again, this time with measles. We had uh, pertussis before, now we have measles and enough is enough and let's just go and take care of this problem once and for all it's great to counsel people but at this point we just need to go and get rid of these things so non-medical exemption is just making them illegal if you have a personal belief that's too bad you need to get vaccinated if you want to go to public school if you no, if you want to attend the school with a bunch of other kids so it applies to both both public and private school so uh -huh. your option is to homeschool or independent study i see where you're not going to put lots of other kids at risk. I see that, and that makes perfect sense because otherwise right. you're really creating a two-tier system of disease. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually interesting enough, a lot of the private schools privately said that we hope this bill passes because you know, an outbreak in a school is never good for the school. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's interesting because the, probably the private schools and you may or not may or may not disagree with this. The private schools have an affluent population that tends to uh, be associated with a little more anti-vaccine belief, depending. Uh, and so maybe they because I know I've, I've talked to some mm. private privately as well. Yes. And they say hey, this is a big problem in our school. Uh, yeah. So, OK, so you, you you so what was the result of that? Well, uh, so we certainly had a lot more excitement uh, out around that, and uh, so the uh, because now it's a liberty thing, right? It's liberty versus oppression well, in some people's put, minds. Well, let's put it this way: um, there is no liberty in the hospital bed if you're infecting one of these diseases. And where's the liberty for the families who are whose children cannot be vaccinated? Right? If you have a baby and you can't go grocery shopping because you're afraid of a disease outbreak. Where's the liberty in that? Where's the liberty when your child cannot be vaccinated and your school's not safe? Where's the liberty and you have an immune deficiency or a syndrome or an elder who is put at risk because you didn't vaccinate your child and you bring that child out into public? Where's the liberty in that? The liberty, your yes. liberty is, is, is infringing on the liberty of others and that's where it ends. Right. And you can't run into a theater and oh. scream fire and cause a stampede, right? It's, yeah. a, it's a similar thing. Well. Yeah, as, as I say, you don't have the privilege to injure someone else's child. Right. And now now they will argue that, no, but that's not what's happening because you don't understand the science, except that you do well, because you trained to do it. So interesting enough, I tell people, you don't have to listen to what I say. Just listen to the science. Actually, you know, when Greta Thunberg told Congress that, I say the same thing. Don't listen to me. Listen to the science. Right. The science is clear. Vaccines are safe and effective. Yep, 100%. And, it, and, and this is the thing. You're going to have adverse reactions occasionally. That's the nature of anything right. that we do. Just like a seatbelt could kill a child. Uh, would you then advocate that people don't wear seatbelts? Would you say that right. the seatbelt industrial complex is killing our children to keep them you know, in line? No, yeah. you wouldn't say that. Right. Uh, and that's, I think people misunderstand. And risk. interesting enough, we pass laws require you to put seatbelts on your children. And if you don't, you can be fined. Exactly right. Exactly right. And, and again- By the way, there's no fine for not vaccinating your child. The fine is you have to homeschool them, in theory, which some of these folks are well, perfectly happy. Well, I, I would remind people, I tell people, like, SB 277 has a consequence. The consequence is not to punish the family that chose not to vaccinate. Mm. That consequence is not about them. The consequence is to protect the child who cannot be vaccinated. But, I mean, people need to remember, it's not all about you. It's actually about the safety of the school of all the children. And so we have lots of rules to keep kids safe at school. And this is one of them. This is about keeping kids safe at school. Let, 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 let me rewind that for a second, because I think people miss this point because they're so focused on individual liberty. You, are, you wrote this bill to protect other children 
from right. a child that is unvaccinated. Exactly. And, and, and because they are at risk. It's protecting the group from the individual that made a choice that is not scientifically valid as a choice. Well, and can bring harm to them. Exactly. Right? That's why we don't let people drive drunk on the roads. If you want to drive drunk in your own private property, but if you go and drive on this street or on the highway, we step yeah. in and say, in sorry, you cannot do that. You and this isn't a punitive thing. In other words, you're not fining them. You're not putting them in jail. You're no. saying, no, you just can't play. You, you violated a social covenant. The social right. covenant is, I will not uh, send a dirty bomb into a classroom. And a child who's unvaccinated, who ends up contracting measles when they're on vacation uh, and comes back into a, into a classroom is the equivalent of a dirty bomb. They're spreading disease that can kill vulnerable children. So that's the way I see it. now. And so the bill was kind of designed in that way. Exactly. Yeah, and you won't use that language and you don't have to. But in my mind, that's how I see it. It's that important. And I see you getting passionate about it because yeah. we've both seen children yes. get sick. Yes. That's the thing. And you know, and this is the thing that you have the mother who says, oh, they have a vaccine injured child. And it's heartbreaking because you see the pain and mm -hmm. they're, they're definitely mm -hmm. uh, feeling something horrible. Mm -hmm. No, you wouldn't wish that on anyone. Right. The problem is it's, it'd be like if I, I make this analogy, if I, if I were driving and, mm -hmm. and heaven forbid something happened and someone hit me and my child was killed by their seatbelt, so some way that it was hanging, mm -hmm. would I then go out into the world and advocate that other children don't wear seatbelts and make it a, my, my life's mission? I wouldn't, but this is very mm. similar. If, mm. Assuming, let's say a vaccine injury is real, which is mm. exceedingly rare, would you do that? You know, It's very hard to find meaning in the death of your child that way, but I, f I feel for their pain, right? Yeah, and, 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 and unfortunately, uh, too many families have been uh, manipulated and drawn in by uh, people who falsely claim that their child was injured by vaccines. And so I certainly I feel for the families who who, who lead that, but I think we need to uh, we, we really need to put focus on the people who are doing this, who are basically quote, giving comfort to the family by falsely making claims that it can hurt other kids. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought this up because this is a, a, a source of just extreme anger for me and this whole platform. People mm -hmm. like Del Big Tree, people like right. Bob Sears, people like these guys. Larry Cook. Larry yeah. Cook. They yeah. go out there and they prey on people who are exactly. having the worst experience of their lives, the, the loss or injury of a child. Mm -hmm. They prey on them like vampires and they talk about how uh, you know, this was this was not you. You know, this was not a bad luck. This was not a terrible sequence of events. This was a vaccine that was inflicted on your child. And here's all the things you have to do. And it's disgusting because these people are vulnerable. They're scared. They're having, and now they feel empowered that this is their mission, and that mission is harming other children. Right. It's the most perverse thing you could ever imagine. And these are the ones that I rant and rave about. It's mm -hmm. not the mother on the fence or the person having trouble sorting right. through the science. Okay, yeah. let us help you. Mm -hmm. It's the people who are professional anti-vaccine mm -hmm. activists, right. which we're gonna get to in your case, yes. because you're a special case where they've come directly after you. So here we are with this bill. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what happened? I'm, again, I'm, I so, love the story. So because, again, uh, we, uh, we get, by the way, it's interesting because people say, well, what about having a debate? Well, this bill went through four hearings, each hearing probably lasting two to three hours. And guess what? We had the debate, <laughs> it's been won. Yeah. The people of California, have said the, both the, their elected representatives, and by the way, polling repeatedly shows, have said, we've had enough. Children need to be vaccinated for the go to school. We need to have safe schools. That's done. The debate's been had. And guess what? Sorry, any vaxxers, you lost. Heaven forbid that the people have spoken. I know, right? exactly. And, but, but and they, then, of course, then after that, they try recalling me. They do a referendum. Referendum, like, totally fails. Not enough signatures by far. Uh, then they try to recall me, and they turn in zero signatures for the actual putting on the ballot. So the people have spoken again and again and again. Oh, yeah, and they speak, they speak in interesting minority ways. So Aaliyah Matheson, because we're live right now, says, mm -hmm. this is literally making me sick. So many lies. You both are tyrants. So I imagine you get this all the time, because I certainly do. So, well, you know what? Um, I believe in the Constitution of the United States. America! The Supreme Court has said it's the job of government to keep people safe. And by the way, uh, in multiple lawsuits, thank you so very much for suing around 277. We now have court precedent that clearly states that 277 is clearly constitutional. And thank you for helping me build that case law. 
Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, the anti-vaxxers out in force, which is great because it means more views, more shares, more Facebook algorithm. Thank you, anti-vaxxers. <laughs> Continue to comment. Um, Felipe says, when my baby girl was born, I was so surprised that the nurse recommended not to vaccinate. I was perplexed. My mom is a head nurse in labor and delivery. I know the truth. I did and will continue uh, to vaccinate my girl, but this is real and scary. So as a healthcare professional, yes. what's your take? And we'll get back to your bill, but right. what's your take on healthcare professionals who do this? It's often nurses, I've found. Well, actually, the vast majority of nurses um, are right on support. Board. Yeah, yeah, right on board. And there's unfortunately, there's always a minority. We talk about a minority of physicians, right? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, many of them who try to profit off of their anti-vax stance. I wonder whether they're truly anti-vax or just simply pro whoever they are. Pro selling my book. Yeah, pro selling my book. Pro selling bleach enemas to kids with autism. Pro yeah. selling, you know, these are. These pro are selling my medical exemptions, right? So yeah. tell me about, well, we're going to get to that. So, okay, so back, this is, again, I keep derailing your story because I'm so fascinated yeah. by so many side branches of this, but let's get back to your bill. So, okay, so you had all this opposition. They never was, were able to get a recall. They were never able to pull it back. The people had spoken. Then what happened? Well, uh, so the bill uh, was, si again, signed into law, uh, implementation. Now, I want to be clear, when we, I wrote 277, uh, we essentially left the medical exemption alone. Yeah. Right. So there was the original bill did not um, adjust the medical exemption. There was a small amendment that was taken up at the request of one of the committees. Uh, but essentially, the medical exemption uh, left it at the discretion of the practicing physician. And yeah. in fact, when I was asked about it in the hearings, I stated very accurately exactly what the state of the law would be if SB 277 was passed, which is that the medical exemption would be at the discretion of the practicing physician. Uh, it's interesting how they try to twist in, oh, he promised something. No, I just simply stated exactly what the law would be because that's my job. I have to be, I want to be accurate in front of all my colleagues. And so one of the things that uh, we then monitored was the medical exemption rate, which uh, actually since the passage of the law has quadrupled. And uh, when you recognize that over 100 <laughs> schools have medical exemption rates over 10%. And then you see all the advertisements, right? So they're passing around on Facebook, on online. You know, Bob Sears had his list of, of vaccine-friendly physicians until he got put on probation. And then I think he kind of took it down. We're, uh, you, we're, we're talking about <laughs> you and looking at you right now. So, um, uh, so basically he said, look, you know, we fought hard to uh, restore community immunity. In fact, right after the bill was passed, the first two years, uh, each kindergarten, entering kindergarten class had immunization rates above 95%. Wow. Right? And, and that's then, the community immunity that's threshold. Community, exactly. Yeah. And then unfortunately on the third year, it dipped a little below that. But guess what? The medical exemption rate had tripled, right? So it's filling the vacuum of, of parents who don't want to vaccinate. They can't get non-religious exemptions anymore. They're going to doctors who are preying on this desire and are- Well, and, but the real issue is this, right? Because my goal is not to get every child vaccinated. I can get vaccinated. My goal is to keep our kids safe at school, right? And so when you go and you say, well, look, actually the immunization rate is starting to dip below the level we need. When we know there's over 100 schools with medical exemption rates above 10%, which is way beyond what science would predict, right? We're talking talking about one, two percent, not 10 percent. Right. And we have some schools with medical exemption races almost above 50 percent. Wow. Th this is not a school full of kids with cancer or transplants. All right. This right. Is, right. So, you know, something's not going right. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is then you had news reports. Uh, you had newspaper down San Diego. The Voice of San Diego identified that in San Diego Unified School District, one doctor wrote a third of all the medical exemptions. I saw that. And I don't think she was taking care of a third of all the kids in San Diego Unified, right? Holy smokes. Interesting enough, the person who wrote the second most number of medical exemptions was a physician, holistic physician, who was actually on probation for the medical board for something other problem. The person who wrote the third no most number of medical exemptions was actually a uh, physician who was a consultant to an anti-vax group. <laughs> And the person who wrote the fourth no most number of medical exemptions at school district was actually Dr. Bob Sears, who's on probation for writing, you know, inappropriate medical exemptions. So interesting of the top four, two of them are already on probation. That speaks something to the character. And, uh, and you know, we'll see whether more of them will be uh, in the future. So that's that one report. And then another newspaper, San Jose Mercury, looked at school districts around in the Bay Area and again, uh, found similar patterns. Uh, there's actually a physician in Sacramento who, for some reason, is writing a lot of medical exemptions for kids in the Bay Area, way outside of the, the, uh, her practice area. 
<laughs> so okay okay yeah i mean it's clear what's happening yes. these guys are capitalizing on this thing yeah. whether it's ideological or money driven i'm sure right. they're charging uh, visit fees for oh, yes. for this stuff and they're they're basically filling a void which we know there are crooked docs throughout mm -hmm. you know that's just the nature of any profession we yeah. do our best to right. bring them out and police them yeah. and this kind of thing on this show we try to shame them openly because i think <laughs> you know shame doesn't always work right but when mm -hmm. you're talking about a professional delusional mm -hmm. cult member mm -hmm. and they're out there influencing people and harming people then i think bringing light onto that is important yeah. and it's something we try to do but it's so so from a legislative standpoint, right. what did you try to do about well, it? Well, so uh, so after after monitoring and watching this happen, certainly we've had conversations with both the medical board and the Department of Public Health about what can we do about this, right? And the medical board basically said, well, our problem is is that um, how we normally operate is is that a patient complains about a doctor, they provide access to the records then we can go investigate the doctor and decide whether we want to uh, sanction them or not. And why would these patients complain? Because they're getting what they well, want. Well, exactly. Yeah. They said, this is the problem, right? We're getting complaints, but the problem is the parents won't cooperate, right? They will not cooperate, and they try to shield these doctors. You know why? Because snitches get stitches, Richard Pan. Okay, just understand that. <laughs> <laughs> the game is to be sold, not to be told. So they're not cooperating. Right. And so what, what, what do you do? So, so the medical board said, sorry, we, our hands are tied, right? In fact, uh, they were able to get one parent to uh, actually allow access to records for a patient for Dr. Bob Sears. Oh. And so that's how he got that on probation. That was the one? The that one was the one, right. Wow. Right. So, uh, so, I mean, basically, that's what they found themselves trying to do. So let me understand. So we're yeah. high. Okay. They can hide behind HIPAA. They can hide, right. hide meaning this stuff is protected. Mm -hmm. the, 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 the licensing board can't just randomly audit their charts and say, oh, look what you're doing. So, the, so, so first of all, of course, the medical board uh, under HIPAA uh, can get access. But the challenge is, is they have to go to court. And mm -hmm. they, in fact, they are going to court to essentially subpoena the records. Wow. And, but the problem is, is that you have to go to the court. And the, and the other issue is, is that the medical board doesn't know who actually got the exemptions, the kids. So what they have to do is they go to court and they say, we want to subpoena all the medical records of this particular doctor. And the families will say, well, we object to that. And right. the judge would have to say, well, we're going to override the family's objections. Which is a big deal. Uh, right, which yeah. is a big deal, right? Yeah. So, so, that, so basically, the medical board said, okay, you know, we have a big problem. We can't, we're having challenges enforcing the law, and we need your help. Okay. Okay. So, so then what happened? So, right. So, uh, so basically recognize with the largest measles outbreak in a quarter century happening in the U S right. R R Richard, I had to do a video called how to recognize and manage measles. measles. Where are we living right now? Yes. That, that we have to do this. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, actually, I would point out that uh, I was program director at UC Davis. Uh, you know, I used to tell people, you probably, here's measles, you probably won't see it. Actually, the residents at UC Davis this year got a chance to actually see measles because there's a child hospitalized with measles at UC Davis Children's Hospital. Wow. Did they have the complex spots and all the other stuff? You know, oh. I, I have to admit, since I'm no longer practicing there, I didn't yeah, set myself, yeah, yeah. but they got a chance to see it. But wow. the other thing I would point out, though, is, is that um, as this outbreak was happening, uh, across the country, uh, in the state of Washington, ever in New York, several cases actually came to California. Several cases came to California, and we did not have an outbreak as large as the one we had in 2015. And guess why? Because we passed SB 277. And even though SB 277 is not fully implemented yet, uh, people have attributed the fact that even the partial protection of just being implemented for those three years was enough to blunt uh, the uh, uh, the outbreak enough so that we wouldn't ha we didn't have a, as large of a one as we had in 2015. You know, we we obsess now in medicine about outcomes. Outcomes right. matter. Process is not yeah. as important as outcomes. Right. Here's an outcome. Yes. You actually save infections and save lives, potentially save a case of subacute sclerosing panencephalitis right. de mm -hmm. a, de a decade later. Yeah. This is a huge accomplishment, and again, it's led by people who've touched patients. People right. like yourself. Yes. So first of all, before we even go on, I want to thank you for doing that. And I know well, you. you're going to get all kinds of kooky people in comments <laughs> like, these two are murderers. <laughs> and then we know the truth, which right. is actually together with this coalition of science-minded people, right. in other words, the majority, yes. the vast majority, right. uh, you're saving lives, yeah. saving lives. So, so 
So now where are we with the medical so, exemption? So, so, bas- so basically then uh, after getting that feedback from uh, the medical board, Department of Public Health, other people said, okay, it's time to track down on the medical exemptions. Because the problem is this. Remember, we dipped below the 95% now also, right? So we have a big measles outbreak going on. We had 95% for year one, year two, and the medical exemption rates continue to skyrocket, and we know what's going on here. So I said, okay, it's time to, to, to address this. And that's yeah. why I authored SB 276 to basically provide oversight over the medical exemption. So, of course, the anti-vaxxers go over the top and say, I'm trying to eliminate medical exemptions. No, it's oversight, okay? We all, we've all been there before where, unfortunately, a very small number of doctors, you know, talk about miracle marijuana prescribing, so forth, who, who don't actually examine the patients. We've seen on Facebook, people saying my child's doctor won't write me a medical exemption so i went and bought one okay (laughs) so it's interesting your own child's doctor said no it's no right should be no right that's it you know that's the person who actually knows your your child right so we know people are marketing this thing we see the advertisements we need to give the tools to the medical board to do their job we need to give the tools to the department of public health because this is a public health issue again my goal is not to get every child vaccinated my goal is to keep our community safe our schools safe so we need to be sure that the department of public health has the tools they need in order to be sure we can stop outbreaks so so let me ask a question what kind of oversight is this because as a person who is is tired of having to click boxes and justify everything I do as a physician. Is this another onerous regulation, Richard Pan? So by the way, this bill was sponsored by the California Medical Association and the American Can Pediatrics, the very doctors who actually have to implement this. And what this says is that if you want to write a medical exemption, this was actually modeled after West Virginia, uh, you submit a, uh, you, you basically submit the application to the Department of Public Health in fact, it will be done through the vaccine registry, and uh, it will be reviewed by a nurse, then a doctor. If actually, if it's if it's going to be approved, then it's fine. Probably the nurse will say that's good enough. Uh, if it uh, looks like it doesn't quite uh, meet muster, a doctor will review it, and then if it gets rejected, it will then go to a panel of practicing doctors who will then review it. Mm. So uh, who basically look at standard of care. And so not uh, some administrator. These are doctors. These are doctors. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So this is not this is not administrator. So basically it's health professionals, nurses, doctors uh, who will be reviewing these exemptions and being sure that uh, they are appropriate. So 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 what's to stop these people because they're already criminals? What's to stop them from just lying and saying, oh, he had an anaphylactic reaction to flu vaccine. Now can't have flu. Well, let's put it this way. If uh, they do it only once or twice, they probably will get away with it. If they are doing it over and over over again, um, then basically that will catch the attention of the medical board who may choose to investigate if it turns out someone's inappropriate. Like if you're not an oncologist, but you're saying all your patients had cancer and that's why they need medical exemptions, that might catch their attention. That Uh, makes sense. But again, again, an investigation does not mean that you're in trouble. An investigation means it's an investigation, but it's the circumstances are somewhat suspicious. Wow. And so where are we with that bill now? So interesting enough, so the bill went through the assembly and the, you know, the Senate and the assembly, and it's, uh, you know, was signed by the governor. But I, I do, I, I do have to take this pause to thank Dr. Bob Sears. He actually did something good. Wait a minute. What? Tom, am I hearing right? Do I have? No. <laughs> Bob Sears sucks. <laughs> well, I, I, I actually have to thank him because um, he, during the assembly health committee testimony, so he actually showed up for the Senate Health Committee, and he actually chose not to testify. They sent some other of his colleagues out in his group. Then he came to the assembly. He decided to come up and testify for himself, right? And, and so the anti-vaxxers have been claiming there have been no fake medical exemptions ever written, right, et cetera. They've been making that claim. And so meanwhile, there's the Assembly Health Committee all sitting there. And the one doctor, the one doctor on probation from the medical board for writing a fake medical exemption is their chief witness. <laughs> And it's, it's like, a bit of a credibility it's kind problem. of like, right. thank you, Bob Sears. Thank you for basically showing to all my colleagues this is a real problem because you're the one guy who got hit by the medical board and you're the guy who's taking up all the time, by the way. Really funny was this. You know, when they uh, first, so what happened is uh, the, the Assembly Health Committee chair set the rules, right? 10 minutes on one side, 10 minutes on the other, and then all the, you know, people who want to express support or opposition, right? So, you know, my team up there, we do it, we actually do it in under 10 minutes. 
the opposition they, gunners. Yeah, they bring, <laughs> they bring in they bring in. Yeah, I know they bring in. I don't know it was five or six people, right? Including, by the way, RFK Jr. Right? Oh, and, that guy. Right? So, but not a doctor. Yeah. Well, yeah. but but the interesting thing was this, right? So between Bob Sears and I think one of the other witnesses, they used up all the time, <laughs> and the other people couldn't say anything, right? <laughs> so so again, Bob Sears became the chief witness. Robert F. Kennedy Jr. couldn't say anything because they used up all the time. So he just said, like, well, I posed the bill, right? <laughs> and so meantime, so Dr. Bob Sears, the one guy on probation with the medical board for writing inappropriate medical exemptions, is becomes their chief witness. And it just becomes like shooting fish in the barrel. That's like, okay, guess weird. what? That's yeah. it. This, <laughs> I mean, that, there you go. That, and then and that, that's the level of <laughs> confidence these guys have in general. I mean, so... So then it, it ended up passing. Yep. And yep. Governor Newsom signed it. So yeah, well we had, we had a little back and forth with the governor's office. We had, you know so the governor expressed some issues. We worked those out. Went to the Assembly Health Committee. Then he tweeted some more issues. And then we <laughs> sounds worked familiar. That There's other officials that do that. <laughs> and then we, we worked those out. And I want to be I'm grateful that the governor uh, signed the bill. Uh, recognized uh, how important it was for us to uh, you know keep kids safe. And that's what this is. About. You know, and again, as somebody who, again, opposes a lot of uh, too much government interference with the clinical practice, yeah. I'm fully on board with this. This is this is a, 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 yeah. a policing issue where when you have criminal behavior within our organization, we need to well, stop the, it. The out. other thing I want to keep in mind is this, OK, because we talk about medical practice, right? So there's no organization in California who is more vigorous and fighting for the doctor patient relationship than the California Medical Association, various medical associations, okay? Um, writing a medical exemption is not a diagnosis or treatment. It's a public health act because this is, right? You, your conversation with your patient or the family about vaccines, that's between the two of you. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. There's no government, whatever, right? That's between you and the family, right? For mm. the child, right? And that conversation is between two of you, whatever you say, there's nothing in the 277, 276, 2109 that dictates what you have to say. Mm, mm, okay? Mm. Right? You say what you say, and then the parent actually decides what they want to do. There's no, there's no, no fine, no penalty, et cetera, for if they say, I don't want to vaccinate. Right? That's, that's the doctor-patient relationship. Now, when you say, oh, well, I, because as a, as a doctor, and now writing, telling a school, telling a school, you have to take this kid, okay, right? That is a public health issue. Yeah. That's not a, you know, that, so that's, that's not effectively the, what you're doing. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah right. So it's, 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 by the way, it's kind of, you know, another parallel would be this. You know, we actually have to, you know, remember, you ever sign those things for the DMV for the handicap placard? Oh, yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And then you send the form, they give it to the DMV, and the DMV decides what you handicap placard. Yep. So, by the way, are people complaining that the DMV is interfering with the doctor-patient relationship because they actually review these things and make the final decision about who gets the handicap placard? No. In the car? Because we don't want people hurting real people with disabilities who are trying to park. Exactly. Yeah. They, they actually need access to those handicap spaces, right? Yep. And we do, know, unfortunately, know sometimes there are people who abuse the system. Uh, but certainly, one thing we don't do is we don't let doctors basically say, by the way, for $100, I'll write you a handicap placard. <laughs> there aren't people who do that because I really need a handicap placard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm back in the Bay Area. This is, the struggle is real, man. Well, so, uh, so, there's a secret Facebook group. Uh, oh, maybe we do it off air, though. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this sounds like th these are actually secret Facebook groups for anti-vaxxers to get exemptions. Secret mm -hmm. Facebook groups for... Uh, opioid addicts to find doctors who are quote unquote compassionate who prescribe mm -hmm. these liberally and mm -hmm. and these are very similar public health sort of impacts so so now because of all your good deeds they will not go unpunished of course so not. you were directly assaulted by one of the anti-vaccine uh, cult members in sacramento yes can you describe what happened during that so um Mr. Austin Bennett, who actually, by the way, is considered sort of a bit of a local anti-vax leader. In fact, he was invited to speak at a vax group uh, as a speaker uh, before. Uh, so he's, you know, he's been harassing me uh, around the district. He's shown up at some different things uh, with his phone or camera or whatever else. And so, uh, uh, you know, he, uh, ran into him in the street, uh, not literally. And then he decided to literally strike me in the back. 
uh, when I walked past him. So uh, this, you know, in term, and actually when I was talking to uh, one of the security folks, he said, this is, you know, certainly people make threats, but it's pretty rare for someone to actually physically strike a legislator. Yeah. And he's proud of it. He posted it on Facebook and to- We reposted it. Right, and yep. it's, it's an adulation from any, it's a, well, some, so many of them said, oh, he's not one of us. It's like, no, you created him, you own him. Yeah, right? he's I mean, yours. Yeah, he's yours. Yeah. I mean, after all, when you constantly post on not only your internal pages, but even on my page that, you know, I deserve to be hung or, you know, shot or something like that, what do you expect is going to happen? Isn't that some kind of like sedition? Like, can you do that to a sitting legislature? <laughs> a legislator, it seems crazy. Well, the, you shouldn't be doing it to anybody. Anybody, legislator, any anybody, right? Any, any, any other. I mean, I threaten Logan's human. life all the time, but he knows it's only seventy percent, you know, <laughs> honest. But you, so, so it's 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 kind of nuts because you look at their sort of leaders, like people like this, who are. Mm -hmm. Basically, thugs and bullies, and well, Del Bigtree, Del basically, Big Tree. yeah, told people, "Say, what are you waiting for with the guns?" Yeah, right. I he's, mean, so he's, he's a cult leader, yeah. is what he is, and he's got his cult, and he's brainwashed them. And but then you look at the side of science, and you have people yeah. like you know Hotez and Paul Offit yeah. and yourself, like <laughs> reasonable people who've trained in science, who actually help patients every day, who do this for a living and you kind of just go how is there the equivalency here that the media had set up you know, this false equivalency that these are well, the same I, right that these are two sides of a debate they're not <laughs> no they're not actually one of the things i find interesting is is that um you know those of us who are out there fighting for vaccines um that's not what we started with right so right. i for example you know i've been recognized for you know by many organizations for the work I did in community health. I talked about, I came to Sacramento to do social determinants of health, train, help get doctors out in the community to have them train. Oh, it's not about vaccines. This is, this is, this is all about, you know, trying to figure out how do we keep people healthier in our community, right? And, uh, you know, Dr. Otez, he, he doesn't just do vaccines. He's out there trying to fight, you know, rare diseases out in, you know, countries where they have poor access to healthcare, right? I've yet to see an anti-vax physician go out and actually champion something aside for, from something that's good for his own pocketbook. Uh, I'm with you a thousand percent, man. I'm with you a thousand percent. And the thing is, look, 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 yeah. uh, again, like as clinicians, right. as, as people that, that touch patients, like it's a little bit of a moral imperative for us mm -hmm. to try to fight against nonsense mm -hmm. like that. Many doctors are afraid, mm -hmm. right? Because they don't want, yeah. you know, whether it's negative reviews, right. patient satisfaction, they don't want to mm -hmm. upset people. It's like, well, mm -hmm. but when kids die, what, what, how do we feel about that? Right. We're not okay with that. We know we aren't. So there's a mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance, even mm -hmm. on our part, that we don't mm -hmm. stand up as a front. Like we don't see physicians marching in the street to promote vaccination. You don't see it. You see crazy people. And again, I, I hate to use the word crazy because my mother's a psychiatrist and we're trying to destigmatize mental illness. Right. Very important. But you see crazy, <laughs> you see very unhinged people going to the state legislator and throwing blood. And so you see yes. that, right? Yes. And this just happened. Right, it is, exactly. Uh, I was told this is the very first time anyone in the entire history of California has actually physically thrown something intentionally onto the floor of the legislature from the public gallery. I mean, so we've th different things have happened up in the gallery and before. And this is California. Right, right. Yeah. right. And, but that has never happened before yeah. that I'm aware of. Uh, so if there's a story who wants to correct the record, that'd be great. Um, but uh, that's what I've been told. And yes, it is someone who has uh, been active in the anti-vaccine movement, posted many anti-vaccine things on their Facebook page, uh, has been engaged. Actually, we I know people have posted uh, remarks that other anti-vaxxers have posted that she had actually even, you know, had been talking about doing something like this uh, uh, prior to actually doing this. So, uh, and you know, if you're going around spreading memes saying that people have blood on their hands, right? And so she's talking about putting blood on, you know, her blood on the floor. You got to draw the connection, mm. right? It basically, it's their violent rhetoric. So oftentimes we may focus on the actual person who committed the act, right? The guy who actually shoved me, the person who throws the blood. But we really need to do is condemn the rhetoric, the mm. violent rhetoric behind the anti-vaccine movement. That because that violent rhetoric is what is triggering these types of acts, and that should not be tolerated.
I'm with you a thousand percent. And then we try to do that as much as we can. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's going to require a collective voice of us because I think the public yeah. too, it feels like we might've dropped the ball a bit as clinicians. Mm-hmm. Now I want to, I want to, yeah. because this is such an important thing, but I want to segue a little bit mm-hmm. into what you do for doctors because here you are, you're a clinician. Now you're representing us. You're not just representing all of, you know, your district, you're representing physicians, nurses, mm-hmm. respiratory therapists, dietitians, mm-hmm. environmental science engineers <laughs> in hospitals. You, you really are our representative because you understand what's going on. And I think that's why clinician leadership is so important. Mm-hmm. How do you think about these topics when you're there? Are you always thinking medically? Or are you thinking just broader? And I'm gonna throw one at you, which is okay. the safety of frontline healthcare professionals, EMS, yes. hospital docs. What, what are you doing about that? So actually, uh, I've worked very closely with uh, many nursing organizations around this very issue. In fact, I went to Cal OSHA uh, to help testify in favor of regulations to address workplace violence. Uh, Just this uh, year, I actually authored a bill uh, around having state hospitals having uh, to be sure that we report uh, workplace violence because uh, we need to collect the information. Then we got to figure out interventions to stop this, right? It's uh, underreported by far. Exactly. Because it's so much trouble when you report it. And then, you yes. you know, the administrator is like, are you sure, you know, that we're going to have to get more security and the patients are going to feel like it's not a hotel that we're trying to create here? Uh, so, 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 so do you think more regulation is the answer for this? Well, it's... Uh, it's not necessarily more regulation as much it is, as it is we need to collect the data mm. and then we need to uh, develop interventions to reduce this, right? If, uh, so it's the classic public health approach, right? What you need to do is you need to define the problem and then figure out how do you, how do you mitigate that, right? Yeah. And so, of course, being at the state, uh, you know, we, we could talk about is this regulation or not, but in, in the end, what we want to do is be sure every health facility has a safe working environment for the health professionals who work in there. And I think that's not unreasonable to ask. That's uh, what every worker should have. Heaven forbid. And you wouldn't jump immediately and say, oh, we should punish patients who are violent. We should do this or that. You're saying get the data, figure out the scope and the nature of the problem as much as we can, and then design solutions to... Right. I mean, we got to think about like what kind of what kind of structures do we want? How do we design facilities? Mm. Uh, It's this is certain we want we came into this profession to help patients. Mm. Right. So and we know there's patients with challenges. Right. And people have stressors. And by the way, being sick or having family members sick is a big stressor. Right. So sometimes people act out in certain ways. Right. So we've got to figure out how we support and help those families. But we also and we also need to be sure that the people who are working in the facilities are safe. Right. So how, how are you supposed to take care of patients when you're being assaulted by other patients? A thousand percent. And you know, what's interesting that they don't talk about mm-hmm. a lot is this is a predominantly female uh, uh, thing. Mm-hmm. So you actually yes. have this very asymmetric abuse against female healthcare yes. practitioners. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and it, what's other interesting thing that I've noticed is that nurses get abused, beaten, uh, injured, sometimes killed. Doctors yes. often yeah. get killed. And, mm-hmm. and it's, it's a very mm-hmm. interesting step up. Mm-hmm. Neither is acceptable, but mm-hmm. there are so many nurses that just see this as, it's just part of the job. Like I'm gonna get, you know, I'm pregnant, I'm, I'm third trimester and I'm, I just got kicked in the stomach by a patient who's angry. Well, or a that, family well that, that, that's not part of the job. And that's why I was at Cal OSHA with nursing organizations saying, we need to be sure we do something about this. How much of your support is from medical people or is it more broad than that? How, how important do you feel that is because you're representing them? In fact, actually, interesting enough, um, most of the people I'm working with are in nursing or other allied health professions. So this has not been so much, I'm not saying that the physicians don't care about it, but most of this is being driven by the nursing profession and then some of the allied health professionals. Can I well. say something that's very controversial that you're not going to yeah. like? Okay. Um, maybe you will. I find that nurses are the biggest advocates, uh, the loudest on social media, and the most organized in terms of opposing these problems and trying to think of solutions, whereas physicians are so heads down overwhelmed, trying to survive, trying to mm-hmm. do the billing codes, trying to click the boxes mm-hmm. that they, and they don't want to rock the boat because we're scared. I think it's been a huge problem. Now, organizations can try mm-hmm. to overcome that, yeah. but we need more brave leaders who stand up yeah. and say, this is the situation, mm-hmm. who actually yeah. work with nurses cause mm-hmm. and other groups. Yeah. They're the they're the groundswell. They've yeah. also got the most bodies. They can get up there in your face and say, yeah. it's time to change this. If we all rose up together and said, you know, this is how it ought to work. We kind of are there. We take care of patients. Yeah. You know, vaccines right. are important important. Yeah. Violence against healthcare yeah. providers is mm-hmm. not okay. We have to destigmatize right. that. We do need to think about how we treat, you know, uh, a sleep, for example, for yeah. schools, which you've worked on. Yeah. And what do you think about this? Do you think physicians have dropped the ball or do you think um, you, we're I, just not given the opportunity? What is it? 
Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't say physicians have uh, dropped the ball, but certainly, uh, and I know you've spoken very eloquently on this, is, is that, um, you know, we have this tension in medicine and in healthcare in general, where uh, basically what we've been trained to do and what we're you know, our values seem to run against what the values are of the places we work, right? And that's the burnout issue. <laughs> the dreaded right? moral injury. And the dreaded moral mm -hmm. injury, right? So when someone does a study and shows, so by the way, we spend however much, you know, four years of medical school, three to seven years or more of residency learning to provide clinical care. And uh, well, let's put it this way, they studied primary care doctors and it turned out that uh, I think they only spend what, around 20, like, 28% of their time doing clinical work. The rest is all overhead. I've actually told people in the workforce field said, well, can we just reduce the administrative work to 50% and we can double our primary care workforce right there without having to, you know, <laughs> create new medical schools and residencies? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's like use use people wisely. Right. Right. It's always the administrators who are telling us smirk, uh, work smarter, not uh, harder. Well, okay, then let's stop the, yeah. the, the requirements for all these clicks. Let's think about right. better processes. Let's yep. come up with a better way to be paid because currently yep. the way we're paid is not, it doesn't make sense. Yep. Like if you're paid for medical exemptions, for example, <laughs> it's going to encourage medical exemptions. We're only as good as our incentives. And then that creates moral injury because mm -hmm. we have conflict. And, right. and it's, so it's, inter it's really interesting because now we have an advocate right in a state that is one of the biggest states population-wide and influence-wise. What happens in California often, for better or for worse, ripples out to the rest yeah. of the country. And I like to see when it's better. And yeah. I think what you're doing is, is very much along that line. So, well, yeah. yeah. So, for example, I talked about how before I got in the legislature, I worked on getting children health care coverage, right? And so since I've been in the legislature, we have expanded access to health care thanks to the Affordable Care Act, but we've enhanced it uh, in California as well. So we're providing health care coverage to all children uh, who are low income. They can get access to Medi-Cal uh, regardless of their documentation status. And so that essentially is what I tried to achieve with our Children's Health Initiative to be sure that every child can get access to health care. When I uh, left, uh, went to the legislature, uh, that program was stumbling because the foundations were because of the Great Recession, losing money and so forth. But actually now I like to say the organization is not needed anymore, hmm. right? Hmm. We are now doing it here in the state of California. We hmm. reduced the number of uninsured by over half. And then just this year, uh, we are actually uh, uh, providing more help, state help to people so they can afford to buy health care. In fact, the premiums in Covered California rose only 0.8 percent that's really low 0.8 percent covered Less california is your state the state exchange change here. right yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so the average and you can certainly do better by shopping around it so that's less than inflation yeah. Think about it. When's the last time we had an increase in healthcare premiums that's less and, than inflation? And it's not because they're denying coverage for certain things? Is that illegal? No, under no. That's, no. Yeah. So actually, this is using the same uh, standard health benefits that we passed in law with implementation. What are you doing about behavioral health? Because we're seeing crises in the ER, people waiting in the yeah. halls. You know, it's an it's a epidemic. So behavioral health is a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, actually, we held several, a couple of informational hearings uh, around mental health. Here in California, we have two main pots of money around that we, uh, through both the Medicaid program uh, and also Prop 63. Uh, we need to make more effective use of those funds. Uh, but you know, some of it goes down to local <coughs> counties. And so, and uh, so it's, we're try trying to unthread some of this stuff. But you know, we, we do, I think uh, we are taking steps to address this. For example, uh, you know, homelessness is a huge issue. Uh, and uh, we actually uh, passed uh, a law to take some of that Prop 63 money to actually help with providing services for people and housing, uh, because you need those two go together. Um, we, you know, so there's a lot of things that we're working on on that area. We're certainly trying to increase access to substance uh, use as well uh, with the opioid crisis. So uh, like deeper and, norphine and, clinics. Right, and exactly. So the, so we are making progress on that. Uh, but I, believe me, I would like to see it move faster. Now, actually, interesting enough, because you talked about mental health, one of the more fundamental issues uh, I've been trying to work on is around the issue of uh, incentivizing uh care for people with chronic conditions. Mm, tell me about right? that, because that's near yes. and dear to my heart with our clinic uh, exactly. turntable. By the way, by the way, you must be doing something right 
in behavioral health because Nevada was exporting patients to you illegally <laughs> for care. So I remember that when I was well, there. that yeah, that's not the right solution to your uh, behavioral health issues is to export the patients to Richard, somewhere else. Richard, if you build it, they will come. They will come. Um, I'm just yes. saying. So, so you were saying about so, chronic diseases. So it's interesting. You you've talked about people exporting uh, people with behavioral health issues, which is, by the way, is usually a chronic condition. Um, so one of our challenges in healthcare is is that if you are in charge of a health plan, so if uh, if somehow a Doc Vader was actually running a health plan, right? Do not take my name in vain, Richard Pan. <laughs> you are the Doc Lord of vaccines. I am the Doc Lord of being burned out, ninety seven percent burned out. There so you. if Doc Vader was in charge of vaccines, uh, well, Doc Vader was actually now put in charge of the health plan, uh, right? And so we know Doc Vader, you know, doesn't you know is, it doesn't want to have burnout, right? And uh, said, okay, well. You guess what? You know, your health plan, you have a whole building full of the smartest people uh, that you can hire, right? The best MBAs, the best actuaries, the statisticians, all this. What do you tell them to do, all right? If you want your health plan to be successful, all right? So what do you tell them to do? And so the thing you tell, do you tell them, do you try to figure out the best way to take care of people with chronic diseases? Do you want to do you want to be known as the health plan that's best at taking care of chronic diseases? No. Right? Because the problem is, is that all the people with chronic disease go, oh, wait a minute, that health plan is really good at it. And they all go to the health plan. And all the other health plans are like, well, thank you for taking oh. our people with chronic diseases. We have I'll keep all the healthy people. No good deed goes, goes unpunished. unpunished. Then you're basically going to what's called death spiral because your premium costs go up. Because let's put it this way: you could provide the best quality care for um, diabetes, right? But a diabetic will always cost more than someone who doesn't have diabetes, who's perfectly healthy, doesn't have any other problems, right? And yeah. so that's the inherent tension there that we have. And so the challenge is, is that if you're the, even if you're Doc Vader who really wants to like prevent burnout and do the right thing, then, you know, the, <laughs> the dark forces will tell you if you still want to stay in business, you got to be sure you have enough healthy people and not too many sick people in your plan. The emperor once told me about this. He said it was called cherry picking. Exactly. Get the healthiest patients, they're giving us money, but we pay nothing. But then the sick patients, if we do well, we are penalized because more sick patients. Is this what you are telling me? Exactly. Dr. So, Dr. Pan, I am not your father. Because that would just be weird. Very strange. <laughs> but you are powerful with the light side, and I resent that. All right. Okay. I, 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 he, sometimes so, he just shows up. So back to the story. Yeah. yeah. So, so the question is, is that, well, what can we do to say, you know what? You have an opportunity to be successful. So I always say, it's, people ask me, like, how, how do I know if health reforms are successful? And I said, well, you know what? It's been successful when I see people wanting to take care of people with chronic diseases. Like, I want you in my plan. I want you in my program. I want you in there. And guess what? Because you're in there, you're in my plan, I can be successful with you in there. I want more of you, right? I want to advertise. If you have diabetes, come join me. I, will, I, I want you. You, you are actually a representative in government. I can't believe this because this is exactly the thinking. This is why we need clinicians in government. So this is exactly what we try to yes. do with our clinic, which is if you were sick, we actually might get a higher per patient per month to take care of you because mm -hmm. we were on a capitated type of right. deal with maybe a gain share if we did well, uh -huh. could share some of that revenue. Right. I mean, that's where you align incentives with right. outcomes. You say, I actually want the sickest patients. Right. I actually, and it was hard because you know if you're trying to take care of Medicaid, it's illegal yeah. to pick the sickest, but you cannot discriminate. Mm -hmm. So you can't say I just want to take care of the sickest Medicaid patients yet. So that's an interesting legislative challenge. Yeah, the other we're, we're actually putting uh, some money for value-based payment in uh, in Medicaid last budget. So we got to work on the implementation part. But yes, we need to change the orientation. I love it. Are, are there other docs in representative government in California here? So actually, Dr. Joaquin Arambula in Fresno is in the state assembly. I'm the only one in the Senate. So yes, I just the two it. of us. I love just you guys. Do you guys go out for like commiseratory dinners <laughs> <laughs> where you're like, man, I'm telling you, these people are crazy. I don't understand how they do it. Like in med school, they just taught us like right from wrong with these people. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> occasionally we have coffee and yeah <laughs> yeah and commiserate so so this idea of again like that's a great that would be a great thing right actual value-based payments and actually promoting mm. these changes in incentives and that's where yes. i think government has an important role because right now government is already people say oh we want government out of healthcare they're yeah. already 50 percent of healthcare if more than 50 percent right between va between tricare between so let's medicare this way. Me medical is a third of all californians it's actually over half of all children in deliveries Wow. Okay. So for pediatricians, Medi-Cal is already half of That's your That's our state Medicaid uh, for yeah. people who don't know. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we, we have single payer there. Yeah. Um, we have on uh, overall, Medi-Cal is a third. So if you add up Medi-Cal plus Medicare plus like CalPERS, you know, which is basically for the state and local employees and some of the other programs, basically, I think we're almost at 60%. Yeah. And that, I mean, so this idea of like, oh, we're going to wave a wand and get government out of healthcare, it's, it's not effective thinking. I think effective yeah. thinking is how do you make government do the smart things that actually right. incentivize good behavior yeah. without overly uh, impinging on clinical decision making, right. which again, is, yes. is, you do need some, like for example, this vaccine <laughs> exemption thing. Like, Well, again, I remind you, the vaccine exemption is about public health. Exactly. Right? We're not telling you what to do in your exam room. This right. is, but when you're exercising a public health power, that's right. what you're doing with the medical exemption. When you write your thing for a handicap placard, et cetera, you are, basically what happens, the state has delegated its sort of governmental authority to you and because it's Absolutely. the interests of making things more convenient for the uh, patients. Absolutely valid point. You know, it's not like you're managing their lupus. You're right. you're making a decision that's going to affect other children and right. so on. Hey, and it's similar to like you know having to report seizure disorder or something for mm -hmm. DMV purposes mm -hmm. and these kind of things. You're really trying right. to protect the public yes. and the patient both. Right. You're really you you have you're you're mm -hmm. you're there's no like divided responsibility. It's the responsibility mm -hmm. to both parties actually. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, so what would you tell young and old? medical people who want to get involved they, they they're all i'll tell you like we've been struggling with this with my group uh -huh. recently like i've been telling right. people i'm kind of burned out like uh -huh. i shout and i scream and i do all mm -hmm. this stuff and nothing seems to change the big powers the legacy players mm -hmm. they're not moving and then i realize but it's these stories that i get where people are like you know what something you said made me go <clears throat> i'm gonna get up and i'm gonna go you know, lead my PTA about vaccinations, or I'm going to go uh, uh, agitate for better safety at work, and, right. and I'm going to organize a group of, yeah. of nurses or doctors mm -hmm. to do something. So this idea of empowering people who feel disempowered, right. what, what advice would you give? Because here you are in a, in a rather privileged position. You actually make decisions that affect legislation. What's your advice to people? Well, advocacy is certainly empowering. And I think it's important for people to speak out. So when I came to UC Davis as in the residency program, I was teaching residents how to advocate. And advocacy came, comes in many different flavors. So I just want to remind people that you don't need to drop medicine and run for the state legislature in order to, uh, to advocate, right? Mm. Uh, and in fact, uh, I know that most people, uh, you know, the reason we win the medicine is to do clinical medicine. In fact, uh, I certainly did not uh, run for the legislature because I did not love seeing kids. In fact, that's probably the hardest, that was the hardest thing to do mm -hmm. was to actually cut back. I still do spend some time seeing patients uh, because that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be in the state legislature. I wanted to take care of kids. And that's uh, why I went into pediatrics in the first place and why I went into medicine. And I still want to keep doing that. Mm -hmm. So that's really important. But I also found that uh, learning how to be a good, effective advocate is something that also helps you with the burnout, right? And uh, uh, and recognizing that you can change things. Uh, uh, now, you know, sometimes it takes some time, and I have to admit that you know I, I got so frustrated with the lack of change, I ended up running for office and mm -hmm. was fortunately successful. Uh, so I guess I, in that sense, uh, I, I, that's what I ended up doing. But uh, there's lots of things people can do. Everything from what I call you know individual patient advocacy for the patients you're actually taking care of to community-based advocacy. That's what I was mainly focusing my resident education around. How do you create new social norms? How do you mobilize people in neighborhoods? You know, something that's uh, that's that's manageable, right? Because you're spending, you're busy, right? I mean, this burnout means you're really busy, right? So, but you can, you can, by the way, you don't have to be, in fact, you probably shouldn't be the person in charge of these things. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So one of the things that was well, that, really- That's hard for me to let that go. I'm well, a micromanager as a doctor. Well, so one of the things that we tried to teach um, the residents in my program when I was at UC Davis around, commu around community health, because they'd come in, we actually would interview them 
both before they started the program and after they did the program. And before they started the program, I said, so, you know, you're here, we're doing advocacy, what do you think the role of the advocate is? And they would say, well, my job is to go out there and speak for people who can't speak for themselves, right? And, and, and go and fight for them, right? And certainly a very noble cause, mm -hmm. right? But what I'm particularly proud of is what we talk about in the program is how do you partner and work with people, right? And, and so forth. And, and actually lift their voices. So when they finished the program, they would say, my job is to help the people in the community be heard, to, allow, to, to be sure that their voices, to support their voices. So it's from, I need to speak for them because they can't speak for themselves to, they have voices and it's my job to lift them. Oh right? man, that's on and, point, and, right? yeah. And so the thing is, is that you don't need, because you don't need to take the responsibility of running the whole thing. You can find partners and you can support them. You can use your moral and, uh, and, and you know, professional authority to support someone else who is go doing the right thing. Right. I, and so that you, so that, and that's how you magnify your influence, right? That's how you magnify the impact. Oh, not your influence. Really, it's how you magnify your impact, right? Yeah. Partner with people, other people who want to do the right thing. And you don't have to be the person actually running it. You can support other people, but you will actually give them that extra oomph because, wow, Dr. So and so, Dr. Z is supporting that person. That the, the, means I need to take a listen to them. I need to work with them. The, 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 I, I take all this advice myself because it, it, it has it's, it's been difficult because, you know, you get a little isolated. You're staring at a camera and you're like, mm -hmm. what am I? Am I connecting? What's going uh -huh. on? And and yeah. and uh, I think this idea yeah. that we cannot we, we, it's not on us to solve the problems, but it is on us to advocate. It is to give a voice, yes. especially if you're in a position like mm -hmm. yours or mine. We, we're here to amplify what we believe mm -hmm. is good based on our. You know, decent credentials and ability. Mm -hmm. Now we may not be right about everything, right? But I mm -hmm. think, you know, we've been yeah. through this trenches. Mm -hmm. We've done this. Uh, you know, yeah. especially on the chronic disease side, I think yeah. about all the great things we were able mm -hmm. to to do and yeah. how it it can be either heartbreaking that you're not seeing it picked up nationally enough, yeah. or it can be inspiring to go. You know what? It just takes a few bright spots to emerge, and then there's a tipping point. And you realize, yeah. oh, we've really made yeah. a dent in this problem. See, I, and I tell people, you know, as a legislator, for example. I'm not the one who's going to figure out how to optimize care of chronic disease, right? I mean, I, even though I have a medical background, right? It's, it's the people on the front lines, right? Your group, other people, right? So my job as a legislator is to figure out how do I help you bring that to scale, right? Yeah. Because I'm not, I'm not the one who's going to figure it out. Yeah, right? yeah, I yeah. Mean, I mean, my job is to pass laws, regulations, pass budgets, stuff like that. The question is, how are we prioritizing things? So how do I help try to support the people who are doing the work and allow it to then grow and go to scale? Because one of the biggest problems I found is not that people aren't doing stuff around chronic diseases. We actually have, you know, loads of people doing stuff, patient-centered medical home, blah, 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 et cetera. The problem is, is that it doesn't go to scale, mm. right? And it's always a pilot somewhere. Right? Uh, uh, and how do, we, how do we take it beyond the pilot? And this, is, this goes back to, okay, well then from a policy standpoint, we gotta realign the incentives, yeah. right? Because the thing is, is that if you're smart, full, building full of smart people are like, well, actually that's great. And you know what? We love it because our current patients with chronic disease you know, could use that, but we still don't want to be known as the plan with the best chronic disease care. Yeah. We just don't want the word to get out that yeah. way. Because it's bad right? for the right. Our main, our my main job is to try to figure out how we get as many healthy people in our plan and not get too many sick people. Then the problem is they don't take it to scale. They're happy to invest in people doing stuff. You know, they want, it's not, and again, it's not because people are trying to be evil. No, they're not. They're, they're, that, that's, they're behaving unfortunately, according to their incentives. They're, they're, yeah, exactly, they're behaving according to what we told them to behave exactly, incentive wise, exactly. right? And it's and, the same with insurance companies. Oh, why yes. don't you support this thing that prevents disease? Because most most people stay on our plan for two years. If I present prevent a case of diabetes five years later, how does that affect me? It doesn't, and it costs a lot, and it's hard. Well. We need to change how that. We need that to change that. Right, right. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Now, okay. So let because I think we've come from like an hour and a half. Where are we at, guys? About an hour and a half. Okay. That's maybe amazing. we go. Maybe we go back to vaccines for a little bit. So. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, let me let, yeah. let, let me say this because I think now the one thing I want to make sure, sure I give you a chance to do is to because I got a letter from you I think okay. addressed to doctors. Yes. And it said, listen, this is what's going on with public yeah. health. 
And right. here's how you can make a difference. And what's your pitch to us here in California to how we can support you better to do what you're doing? Because clearly, I'm sure. sold that you care, you're an advocate, you, you're very smart, very compelling, but also you understand the emotional impact these things have, which is a rare combination. Sometimes we Thank get you. very cerebral. Okay. What, what's, what's the pitch to us to help you? Well, uh, first of all, I do appreciate the tremendous support I've received from not only physicians, but other health professionals uh, for the work I've done to actually strengthen public health, whether it's vaccinations, newborn screening, other things. Uh, you know, can, we, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Do you focus on the negative comments or do you actually appreciate all the love and support you get from us? Oh, I appreciate all the love and support. That's a brilliant thing. Because that, that, that's a struggle sometimes. We're As humans, yeah. we have a negativity bias and we pick out the negative and we feel we feel bad about it. I'm glad that no. you're able to pull the positive. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I really appreciate the support. We, you know, have people, uh, who, who strongly support and I really do appreciate that. I should, uh, point out the reason for the letter is, uh, I, I had, uh, they're once again, trying to recall me, uh, from the legislature. Uh, I have to admit that, uh, uh, last election, I ran against someone who went full anti-vax. Uh, Robert F. Kennedy did radio ads uh, attacking me and so forth. I still won with 70% of the vote. Wow. Uh, but, you know, I have to take these things seriously. So I do have a webpage, www.keepdrpan, K-E-E-P. <laughs> drpan.com. So if you want to sign up and say, I want to support Dr. Pan, whether it's financially or just simply signing on to my mailing list, I'd appreciate that. Uh, so we can, uh, beat back these efforts by the anti-vaxxers, uh, who, uh, you know, uh, basically, well, they want, uh, they don't like good public health. So, uh, I, you, know, <laughs> you normally I am like, Oh, don't be shilling on my show. You politician. <laughs> But this is one of those things where I'm like, man, I am with you. Like keepdrpan.org, is it? Dot uh, com. Dot com. Yes. Dot yes. com. Keepdrpan.com. Dot com. And uh, listen, if you guys, <laughs> I, again, I, I don't have a lot of politicians on the show because it's, it's a tough thing, right? Because yeah. often we're talking about divisive political issues. And in this case, we're talking about public health. We're talking about doing the right thing. Right. We're talking about physician advocacy, clinician advocacy. We're talking about good people yes. trying to do the right thing. And and I think we should support you in well, thank that. thank you. Especially if they're trying to recall you because of vaccines. Exactly. Stuff. Oh, I will fight that tooth and nail. And then yeah. I'll vote for your opponent just to be oppositional. <laughs> 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 Because that's part of who I am, Dr. Pan. I'm a go. bad person. <laughs> oh, man. Anything else you wanted to, to talk about on the show while we have you? Uh, we've well, talked about a lot, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I appreciate uh, uh, being here. And I want to thank you, uh, Z-Dog, for your advocacy and speaking out on uh, these issues. Uh, and I know you had uh, not only on vaccinations, but many other issues. I think a lot of times I hear people actually raise uh, what you've talked about in terms of the moral hazard and uh, issue. Wow. Uh, so that that certainly has resonated in the medical community uh, that uh, I've certainly heard from many people and they and people appreciate your leadership in that. But also just important about, uh, as you said, encouraging people to speak up, right? So one of the challenges we have on whether it's social media or other places is uh, what some people call data voids, but it's not just data. We need those voices speaking out. Yes, there's going to be the trolls and the people who go and attack. But you know what? As someone who's, you know, uh, who's often a target of that. Uh, I really appreciate when people just speak up and say, you know what, and you don't have to respond to the trolls, by the way. You know, so someone will troll after your comment. Just say, you know, I support you, thank you. And I'm standing up for vaccines, I'm standing up for good public health. And so when uh, physicians are on social media getting that message out, that helps a lot. And I know many of your followers do that. That was great advice. Very, very powerful because people are scared and I think overcoming our fear to have a voice is right. important. And when we have role models that actually do that, and again, now I'm just blowing smoke up your butt, but I believe it. I actually <laughs> believe you. it. You know, it was wonderful to have you here. I hope you stay safe and I hope Thank that, you, uh, you know, the, you, your security t detail is beefy, which I think That's it why is. we're in our undisclosed location. That's right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. There's people with the little earwigs, find them and destroy them, you know, and, and they're acting like vaccines. They're like antibodies. So yeah. it's really a thrill, man. And, uh, Hopefully we can have another conversation. Yes. Maybe I'll come up to Sacramento, see what you do. Take me on a little tour. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be a Love lot to. of fun. I'll bring Tom and Logan, who probably are under risk. <laughs> <laughs> the Bay Area and back down. <laughs> Kelly is with it. Put they Mac down. Give me love, Richard Pan. <laughs> Z-Dog MD, together. It's an alliance made in I don't know where, but we love it. Thank you so much, Dr. Pan. Thank you. Soon to be Senator Pan because you're going to be you know, in, in, in the Senate longer. But ah, the term limits. The there you term go. Term limits. 
don't let them recall him. Go to keepdrpan.com and have your voice be heard. And we out. Peace. Bob Sears is the worst. <laughs> <laughs>